eksklusif untuk Anda bersama dengan Direktur sekaligus Corporate Secretary dari Bumi Resources, Dilip Srivastava. Mr. Dilip, good morning to you. Thank you for coming back to Energy Corner CNBC Indonesia. Good morning, Pak Irvin. It's nice to see you again. Sir, first of all, how do you see the recent coal price uptrend? Will it be continued and how do you foresee that? We believe that there have been three or four factors which have been impacting the price. It is not something that has happened overnight. We have seen this trend developing uh, from 2019. In the previous period, the coal price had dropped to a benchmark of below $50 per ton. And we have seen in the latter second half of the last year that the prices have begun to harden. And this was largely influenced by developments in China influenced largely by the pandemic, leading to a variable demand in China and erratic demands from traditional markets. When it comes to this year, we have seen prices climb to $157 as far as the Newcastle index is concerned. And when we look at the rest of the year, we see the range anywhere between 130, 135, going, going around 150, 155. So I would say that the trend for this year is buoyant. Mm. And when we look at next year and the year after, which is 22 and 23, mm. it does appear that there's a contango and the prices can be sustained at near current levels as far as possible. There could be corrections, but we don't see it dropping below 100. All right. We keep talking about the commodity super cycle. With this, skyrocketed even increasing coal price, even reaching 151 US dollars per ton, will be somehow confirming the prolonged commodity super cycle. And what can Indonesia do to take the moment? Urban, that's um, a very interesting question. Now, we have to distinguish between temporary cyclical upswings driven by post-pandemic growth versus a super cycle, which actually continues for a period of 10 years. Now, when we are looking at metals like copper and gold, we are seeing upswings and those could be categorized as coming close to a super, super cycle as markets recover and growth returns and there is reindustrialization of activity following higher growth as people get more accustomed to the impact of the pandemic and the recovery. When it comes to coal, we must remember that um, coal has been under scrutiny by the green lobby and the renewables lobby. And the funding institutions have stepped in as well, where there is very, very restricted funding for new coal projects. Mm. This means that new coal projects will find it almost impossible to secure new funding, which limits supply. Now, when it comes to supply, I have said it will look limited as far as Bumi is concerned. We do not really have much plans to grow except go downstream into gasification mm. and green energy where coal can be the feedstock. So when I look at demand for coal, I have seen developments in uh, Europe, Germany and France, and we've also observed developments in um, USA and we've seen uh, releases from Japan and a move towards energy over the medium, towards um, renewables over the medium term. Now our view on this is that in Asia, there are already about 350 coal fired power plants that are slated to come up over the next three to five years. But supply is going to be limited. And if supply is going to be limited, 
then it should have a salutary effect on a higher coal price. So it's difficult to predict a super cycle for coal. It is probably easier to see that trend in metals. But my view on our view on this is that coal is here to stay for the next 20, 30 years, and we are building for that. It's a national priority in Indonesia. Uh, it is necessary to um, lower imports of fossil fuels in favor of fuels which are domestically available like coal. So we are progressing our forward thinking over the next 10 years in the green direction and offering hybrids and going downstream into gasification. Taking, uh, and we are very happy and we are pleased that the government is taking due recognition, giving encouragement and incentives. Mr. Dilip, what should we understand really when we talk about the renewable energy sources becoming stronger and new norm and accepted worldwide, the nature of the coal demand, what's been happening lately? See, if you're looking at examples of Europe, which is Germany and France, they've had a very, very hot summer. And they've relied fully on renewables during this period and they brought out a nuclear as well. Mm. Now, what has happened, the problem with renewables is it's storability, it cannot really be stored. So when you have peak demands and you have less sun and limitations on wind, then you have to fall back on an alternate energy. Now, we have seen this evidence in Germany and France, and we have seen this evidence in, uh, mm. uh, in USA, and we are seeing that in China as well. Mm. China have had variable demand and supply patterns for much of this year, largely due to extreme weather conditions. They've had a very hot summer, they've had floods, they've had safety issues. Now these kind of issues cannot be avoided completely. So we expect this variability to continue and supply will continue to be a major constraint and that would impact prices. So to answer your question, I think that in Asia, we are seeing a two to 3% increase in demand this year. And that is likely to continue at a rate of one or 2% over the medium term. Mm. We do not see coal disappearing in, um, in uh, Asia. And uh, though there would be a move to renewables, renewables cannot replace fossil fuels to the extent of 100%. Our best guess is that perhaps renewables can replace fossil fuels to the extent of about 25, 30%. There are far too many other constraints mm -hmm. involved. Mr. Dilip, bear with us, please. We are going to continue our discussion right after this one.